Good morning, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live, also Danoon Institute of Biblical Research. Very, very, very serious message today here, friends, and uh, a discovery I made in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls has really brought me back to the place where we're going to discuss uh, the two witnesses of Revelation 11. Uh, in light of the prophecy of Malachi 4, if you happen to be Jewish, it's still Malachi chapter 3 for you. It's just the last six verses of Malachi chapter 3. And I, I normally like using the Mamre uh, version where we can look at the Hebrew at the same time, but uh, I, I haven't set up internet here in my office as of yet, so I film out here, but I haven't got everything set up. So <clears throat> it takes a little time to do that. Um, and uh, just a lot, under a lot because of uh, all, all the things we're doing out here. But at any rate, I'm also going to be speaking, uh, and I'll probably do that more on Patreon. I'm doing a message for Patreon where I'm going to be speaking again about uh, the asteroids or meteorites. And I'm going back to that subject again because... Biblically, this is what the final judgment is. And not only the final judgment we see in the book of Revelation with the seventh angel when he sounds uh, and when he brings forth that last woe, pours out that last vial, uh, it is with lightning and with great hail, uh, which are, in my opinion, meteorites. Well, in the Qumran scrolls, I came across a fragment recently. It's fragment 4Q558. It's called the vision is the name of that fragment. And it's a very small fragment, but it is very obvious that they are referring to Malachi's prophecy uh, that we're going to be speaking about here, the judgment itself. Malachi 4.1 for those King James uh, Version uh, or regular New Testament Bible holders and Malachi chapter 3, like I said, of the last six verses beginning at that first one there for uh, our Jewish friends that would be listening to this broadcast. And I'm hoping that on iConnect uh, that they're going to make this available in all of the languages, specifically Hebrew, Russian, Spanish, things like that, so that you'll be able to watch this as well. They've been wanting to do a, a test run on it. So I'm hoping this will be the video that we can get this done on because the information to me is that vital. <clears throat> now, so let me take you first to this fragment here and I'll post it on the screen for you so you can see it. I'll photograph it here. Uh, and the fragment states in line three, the eighth is an, an elected one and C, I, and then we go to line four, to, to you I will send Eliyah before, okay, and then there's a blank spot, which if we look at the before, we know from Malachi chapter 4 there that it's before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But, now this is not a Malachi writing, but it's quoting the same thing. But in line 5, power, lightning, and meteors. Yeah, you heard exactly what I just said. Power, lightning, and meteors. So the great destruction of Malachi chapter 4 that is spoken about when Elijah the prophet comes is to bring about a destruction of lightning and meteors. Now, I know there's a lot of people that apply Malachi 4 to that of John the Baptist. And so we're going to be getting into all of these things today. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and I'm going to be uh, pure leaf green, dark tea, whatever. I say that because somebody said I was drinking beer one day when I was I always drink unsweet tea. So anyway, 
Uh, I want to break down all the scriptures on this. We're going to be looking in Malachi 4, of course, the Dead Sea Scrolls, Psalm 106, Deuteronomy 18, Revelation 11, Matthew 11, and also Matthew chapter 17, Deuteronomy 9, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Revelation um uh, Going back to Revelation 11, you're the latter part of that, and then Revelation 16, if you're following these in uh, your scripture notes there. And so let's first, uh, let's first examine Malachi chapter 4 here, and it states here, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in that day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse." Now, we're going to take our time because I really want you to understand what's written here by God's grace. Scripturally, it is applied to John the Baptist of Elijah of Malachi. But if you'll ever notice when Jesus does this, he does it with a twofold time frame. And also, scripturally, we only see that John's prophecy is fulfilled in turning the heart of the fathers to the children, never the heart of the children to their fathers. Now, of course, who are the fathers? In my opinion, the fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You could even include Moses in that category as well. But it is the faith of the fathers. What was the faith of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It was the coming of the promised seed. And of course, that seed is singular, as Paul says, and contrary to what Tovia Singer says when he claims there's no such thing as seeds, plural, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, yes, there is. And I don't have that marked. I wasn't planning on bringing that issue out. But uh, I don't even know if I have the right book with me on that one. But I have done that in many times past. Yeah, I think here we go right here. Um, <clears throat> if you were to look at the fragment, in, uh, and I think this is the one, maybe, maybe not. Uh, yes. Yes, it's actually in fragment 4Q390. They will defile my temple. Talking about the Levites. They will defile my temple. <clears throat> they will defile my Sabbaths. They will forget my festivals. And with the sons of a foreigner, as they will be debase their offspring, and their priest will act violently. All right? Now... <clears throat> That's one, and the offspring, of course, is the, um, let me just find this in the Hebrew language real quick, because that's what you need. You don't just want it in English. Oh, that page had fell out. That's the page that fell out. I had a page fell out this morning. But yes, the offspring is using the words seeds, plural, in that case there. Um, so I, I'm not able to show that, share that with you right now. But anyway, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have multiple places where the word seeds and seed is used simultaneously, even in the same verse there, showing that there was a difference between the coming of the promised seed, which was the Mashiach, the Messiah, and that of the 
children that would be born uh, to the Levites through the mingling of the seed that we see over in the book of Ezra, chapter 9 there, just for a reference point for those of you that might be curious about that. Now, so going back to what we're looking at here in Malachi 4, uh, verse 1 there, it, the day comes, it shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. That's another very important uh, uh, scripture verse right there, that it leaves them neither root nor branch. The Antichrist is a imitator of that of Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our true Messiah. He is the imitator. Jesus is the root and offspring of Jesse. He, he uh, likens himself. He says, I am the, the, the root, you are the, the, uh, I'm the vine, and you are the branches. Why? Because Jesus was and is that tree of life, the eighth Chaim, that we find written in the book of Genesis. And the serpent is the one that came on the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So the serpent also is represented by a tree and the branches of the serpent uh, of his tree of knowledge of good and evil are those people that are born from his lineage, just as, as we see the mingling of the seed that is done, the hybrid, the half-breeds, so to speak, uh, it leaves them neither root nor branch. So the day will come, a day of judgment that will destroy the Antichrist, which is the root and the branch, which is those that were grafted into this demonic, ungodly uh, people that have reestablished under a Rothschild domain uh, the nation of Israel today, which will lead the world into apostasy. Uh, and I say that about the Rothschilds because the Rothschilds are Egyptian descent. They are of a royal Nephilim bloodline. Uh, that was shared with me from a friend of mine that has the had access to documentation that most people would never have access to. Uh, so that's why I'm troubled and I'll uh, and hopefully if I can remember where that scripture is I'll share that with you that there's actually a scripture that speaks of that as well. But he goes on to say but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. That is none other than Jesus Christ. And remember the scripture over in, uh, what is it, uh, Zechariah chapter 8, I believe it is, where it speaks about the ten men of the nations will take a hold of what? The wing of a Jewish man. That Jewish man is the Messiah. And that prophecy is, you're seeing it right here in Malachi 4.2, uh, with healing in his wings. And of course, Yeshua, Jesus, he went forth and he healed uh, the people, uh, the power in his wings. What did they say? If I could just touch the hem of his garment, the woman said, I know I'd be made well. The hem of his garment. In another place, uh, uh, we find this used in the Hebrew, Matthew, uh, when they were up, when Jesus was up near the uh, Galilee, the, the people from Syria came and they said, let us just touch the wing of his garment. Yeah, actually uses the word wing there. So very interesting there. So this is, this is the part of Christ coming, but it's still show, foreshadowing in, in chapter one that all this has to happen before or before this, before the judgment comes, these will be the things that we will see, which is the coming of Christ. All right. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Rem now, watch this. Verse four. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded to him and Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. By the way, we're going to go to that in just a moment to see what happened when Moses was commanded the statutes and judgments. It also reflects here in Malachi 4. He says, Behold, I will send you, Eliyah, actually, just like we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls here, Eliyah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And the Dead Sea Scrolls actually tell us that when Eliyah, before he comes, It'll be before what? The power 
lightnings, and meteors. So this dreadful day that will burn up all the Nephilim bloodlines and those that have grafted themselves into their lineage is going to be destroyed, we know how now, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, by power, lightning, and meteors. How many of you remember when I was giving you an intel briefing one time, I spoke to you not only about the fact that they said meteors are coming, that we're that this binary system that's passing through, which by the way is believed to be every about 35, 3600 years, it is believed to be what passed during the time when Moses and all the plagues that hit Egypt. Uh, but it's believed that that's what's coming now, the exact same binary system that passed 3500, 3600 years ago is what's coming now. And only this time, this time is to be far more destructive. Uh, as I've even been told that we have outer bands coming again towards the earth uh, in, I think, what, April and May, somewhere around there. And then again, another band will come through. Not, not annihilation type bands yet, not the type of bands that would bring this utter destruction. But the other thing that I was told as well is that we would also experience what is called plasma lightning as a result of this binary system. And that's when the ozone layer has absorbed all this energy from this system that it, it stretches the ozone layer out and then it releases a lightning strike from it. And it is believed by scientists that this is one of the ways the Grand Canyon may have been created in one day was from a plasma lightning strike. And I was told that that type of lightning will knock a, a hole in the earth as deep as the Grand Canyon. So before we rush to judgment and say, all oh, these things are just ludicrous, Steve, you're saying that we're going to get hit by asteroids, meteorites, or whatever the case may be. And I've often quoted from Revelation, well, there's going to be stones, hailstones that are going to hit the earth, the weight of a talent. I know there's different ideas of how heavy that is. I've heard different thoughts on that. A hundred pounds is what I basically remember. Maybe wrong on the weight, but still, that's some pretty doggone big stones. But I did not realize, uh, just in memory, that also in Revelation, it's lightning and hail, just like in the Dead Sea Scrolls. All right, so let's continue on. So behold, I send you, this is before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. All right, so as I said to you, we know that Part of this has already been fulfilled, and, uh, and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and go to the Matthew prophecy of this, um, and that would be in, let's see, we'll look at, let me just, a lot of these are already up on the screen, so maybe I can just quickly bump into these real fast. Uh, no, it would be the other way. All right, Matthew, everywhere I'm popping up at, it's always looking at something there. Let's see here. All right, I've got Matthew 11, let's see, Matthew eleven fourteen is one. For all prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you will receive it, this is the Elias, or that's the Greek word for Elijah, which was for to come. He that hath ears, let him hear. All right, that's one place where we know that Elijah of Malachi 4 is applied to John. But the one that really catches my attention is after the Mount Transfiguration uh, event, which is in Matthew 17. It's also recorded, I think, in the book of Mark. Uh, and they're all very consistent in the way it happens. Behold, there appeared unto the, them Moses and Elijah talking with him. That's uh, so when Jesus had that transfiguration. They answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And you notice there's a voice. They didn't see anything as a voice. Same thing that happened on Mount Horeb. 
And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, saying, Tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must first come? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias, or Elijah, or Eliah, however you want to pronounce it, truly shall first come and restore all things. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but Jesus is at this point now putting the coming of Elijah in the future and also a restoration of all things. And yet John the Baptist is already dead. And it's in the future tense, if you look at the verbiage in the uh, Greek there. But then he says in verse 12, But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. Now, if you remember the prophecy that we find over in Deuteronomy uh, about the Lord thy God raising up a prophet like unto me, In all things, what he says, you are to hearken. The true restoration is with Jesus Christ himself, not even with Elijah. So then why then would Jesus say that Elias truly shall first come and restore all things? Because they will pervert the words of Jesus over the next 2,000 years to such a place that if Elias did not come or Elijah did not come and restore back what was spoken by Jesus as a witness that we see, then how could he bring judgment? Think about it. Let us soak for a little bit. That's why I say to you as well, when we look at John, John is clearly, it is prophesied at his birth that he would return the heart of the fathers to the children, lest the Lord comes, or to the heart of the fathers to the children. But nowhere does it say that he'll turn the heart of the children to their fathers. So it's little things like that that I, that I watch carefully as I begin to see these different things here, right? So now we'll quickly, before we, we're going to back up uh, here to Malachi 4 here in just a second. But what I would like to do, though, is let me take you real quick to Revelation 11. And uh, and we'll quickly look at the witness of the, uh, the two witnesses of Revelation 11. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise, measure the temple of God, the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out, measure it not, for it's given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot for forty and two months, or three and a half years. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. All right. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Now, let's just pause just for a second here. These are the two olive trees and two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. That's quoting, uh, what is that? Zechariah chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken, is where that is quoting from. The two, remember there is the, uh, basically it's, it's typing there, a, uh, the olive, excuse me, the, 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 like, a, like a menorah type of uh, tree with the seven branches. And from that, we see that on either side of the, of the golden lampstand is the two olive trees. And of course, uh, Zechariah is asking the angel, what are these two olive trees? And he said, these are the two anointed that stand before the God of the whole earth. Okay, now, there I know there's two schools of thought. People always say, you know, the two witnesses, always, a lot of people say it's Enoch and uh, Elijah because they said they have to both die. Uh, and they quote the scriptures, it's appointed a man wants to die and after this the judgment. If you go to that that particular scripture that Paul speaks about, appointed once to man to die, then after this the judgment, has nothing to do with mankind. It's only dealing with Jesus Christ as a sacrifice. That's why John's or Paul writes in there, it's appointed to man once to die. 
In other words, Christ was not to have to die over and over and over. It was appointed for him only to die once. Not that he had to be smitten twice, but to be smitten once. And then after this, the judgment, oh my, maybe we should take just a moment to go there. Let me see if I can pull that up for you there. Um, because if we don't go there, I'm afraid that people are really going to miss this and get stuck on the whole thing about, um, let's see here. Hmm. Yeah, here we go right here. Hebrews 9.27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. All right. You go back and read the whole thing. It's all talking about the sacrifices and the shedding of blood and the remission of sins and and in other words, there had to be a continual sacrifice, always something dying, something dying, something dying. But then it comes when he gets down in verse 27, uh, he's, or let's start with verse 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So it has nothing to do with mankind. But what's even more troubling, in my opinion, is when we look at the scripture here, uh, as I was sharing with you, and um, let's see, where am I at here? I'm going to come to that one as well here in a moment here. But... Uh, when we're looking at Jesus, and and I forgot, let's see, and we and we see the fact that uh, oh, we're we're in Revelation eleven is what it is. That's where we got to get back to. Okay, okay. And so we're looking there, and and it's Scripture speaks about these two olive trees that the, 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 these two witnesses are represented as as the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And you already know that those two olive, that the two olive trees that are on either side of the golden lampstand, you know that that golden lampstand is a representation of Jesus Christ. And then you see it fulfilled at Mount Transfiguration in the scripture we just read to you. And it's Moses and Elijah standing on either side of Jesus. Then you should know automatically who the two witnesses are. And then take that and couple that with Malachi 4. God says, remember ye the law of my servant Moses. And then he speaks of Elijah coming before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Again, Malachi identifies both Moses and Elijah. Zechariah identifies that the two olive trees on the either side of the golden lampstand, which Christ is that golden lampstand. And then you deal with the fact that Mount Transfiguration shows that being fulfilled. Here are the two olive trees standing beside Jesus Christ there on Mount Transfiguration. So that takes care of the identification of who they are. But he goes on to say, if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Uh, these have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. They have power over the waters to turn them to blood and smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Clearly, we're seeing ministries of Moses and Elijah there. And speaking of Moses and Elijah and their ministries there, I believe we have also another interesting one. I didn't mark it here, but I did see it a second ago. Let's see if I can go back to it, where they're, they're the, uh, the, the apostles of Jesus um, were standing there with him, and they said to Jesus, uh, here it is right here. This is in Luke chapter 9 when they passed the Samaritan village. They weren't very much accepted. 
Uh, and, it, and, it, and it came to pass, verse 51 here, that they should uh, be received up steadfastly, set his face to, to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him. The Samaritans didn't receive Jesus when he came because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he returned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now, it almost sounds like a slap in the face, so to speak. But yet, when we read in Revelation 11, that's exactly what they will do. So why did Jesus then rebuke them and say, you know not what manner of spirit you are of? For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. If you go back to Malachi 4, like I said, Malachi 4 deals with two different time frames altogether. One is right before that great, great and dreadful day of judgment. But we also see the son of righteousness arising with healing in his wings, which was Messiah, which was that, that time frame. So when Jesus rebuked them saying, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of, it's basically saying, You've not been anointed with that spirit of Moses and Elijah for that hour in the first place. John was the one that was ordained with the spirit of Elijah, but never did John call down fire to devour any of his enemies. So again, that's another part of scripture that's yet to be fulfilled. Because Elijah, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, according to Revelation there's going to be fire that comes down that destroys the enemy. But it wasn't 2,000 years ago. That was the time of mercy. Okay, so let's go back then. Again, Revelation 11. We'll find, see if we can find that again. Uh, and when they shall have, verse 7, 7, finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies, as we know, shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, which is a reference to the Nephilim bloodlines, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Now, I've been teaching this for years because the Lord had revealed to my heart the main part of the witness of, the, of Moses and Elijah is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ because it has been mocked by people for the last 2,000 years. The Jews have carried on their tradition that his body was stole away and he just lived some normal life somewhere else. He even had this nonsense that, you know, he went up, got married, had children, and uh, the English clan is the descendants of Jesus. All kinds of nonsense like this, right? Their death, burial, and resurrection is the witness that gives God now the, it now brings it under the judgment for those that have rejected that Jesus Christ truly was the Messiah. Now the witness of the resurrection has been played out before their eyes. And you have to have, according to the law, two or at the most three witnesses before you stone a prostitute. And that's prostitute male or woman, by the way. It's not just the girl like they wanted to stone the woman there they brought out there before Jesus all right so that is why this is like that and I have if you go back to the teachings I've done on the two witnesses I've spoke this for years now and others have picked it up since then and now speak about it but uh, something I definitely had went into quite a bit same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand the remnant were frightened and gave glory to the God of heaven now real quick before I go any further I do want to show you this one part here and then we'll jump back to it in a little bit when you get down to Revelation eleven fifteen all the way down to 19 this is where the seventh angel sounds 
Uh, we see that in Revelation 7, 10, that the mystery of God should be finished as he has declared to his servants, the prophets. What is that mystery? It is the mystery of judgment. It is the mystery of the whore of Babylon being judged. It is, there's are so many things that can be wrapped up into this. This is the third woe that comes down. Uh, this is Christ is now reigning. Uh, it is, uh, and it spans 2,000 years worth of time as well. But the final part is the destruction. And that's where uh, we read verse 18 to 19. And the nations were angry and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, to the saints, to them that fear thy name and great, uh, excuse me, and small and great and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Right? And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. All right, again, Dead Sea Scrolls says power, lightning, and meteorites are going to be used uh, according to the time when Elijah returns that final advent there which brings judgment on to the earth and now we're seeing this this happens under the seventh trumpet the seventh angel when he sounds that's what happens it brings about a destruction and an annihilation of everything on this earth all the wicked all that do evil etc all right so now fingers very dry I apologize about that let's let's continue on now we as I also we want to go and look at some scriptures related to the fact that in Malachi 4, uh, we had read that verse 4 says, Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto them in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and judgments. All right. Let's look, though, and see what happened at that time. Psalm 106 is one of my most favorite ones. So let's look at this one first. David wrote here in the psalm, they envied Moses also in the camp and Aaron, the saint of the Lord. The earth opened and swallowed up Dathan and covered up the company of Ibaram. And fire was kindled in their company and the flame burned up the wicked. Very similar situation, but on a very small scale. What happened then is about to happen now. They made a calf in Horeb. So here it is. Here's Horeb. Worship the molten image. They're about to make another idol out of a false messiah. Thus they change the glory into the similitude of an ox and the earth grass, and they forget God, their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Interesting, interesting, they forgot God, their Savior. This is why they're going to destroy Damascus according to uh, Isaiah 17. As you get down to verse Isaiah 17, verse 10, you have forgot the God of your salvation. Speaking to Israel, you make Damascus a ruinous heap. Paul was going down there to make Damascus a ruinous heap as well, right? But the Lord Jesus stopped him on his road to Damascus and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Why did Jesus stop him? Because the destruction of Damascus would be in the latter days. And both Israel and these, the, the Christian people that have called themselves Christians that have forgot the rock of their salvation, because it says in Matthew 17, let's, let's go, let's go to it real quick. We got to go to it. All right. We have to just quickly go to this because you have to understand there is, it's interesting that David in the Psalm says they forgot God, their Savior. And yet, at the same time, I'm very much aware of uh, the implications of that itself. Right? Because we're at the precipice. Israel is continuing to bomb Damascus. Right along with the United States. Supposed to be a Christian nation, right? The cities of Aurora forsaken shall be for flocks, and she shall lie down. None shall make them afraid. Verse 2. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus. Why does it say the fortress shall cease from Ephraim? Because it was the house of Israel, according to Acts chapter 2, verse 36. Hear you, all house of Israel, this same Jesus whom you have crucified is, been, is Lord and Savior, right? I'm just paraphrasing it. 
So the house of Israel came home 2,000 years ago. They are there in the book of Acts of all the nations and kindreds and tongues. And it's not Jews, it's Judeans. So the fortress all shall cease from Ephraim. Why? The Syrian government had been protecting the Christians for 2,000 years there. And the kingdom from Damascus and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, the glory of the children of Israel become <laughs> dispersed throughout the entire world. Right? So Damascus becomes a ruinous heap, according to what the scripture says. Verse 1, the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. All right? And why, though? When you get down to verse 10, because thou hast forgotten what the God of thy salvation and not has not been mindful. That's why I tell you, it, it affects both Christians and the, 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 the so-called Jewish people of today. Or Jewish people of today. You forgot the God of thy salvation has not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Which again, it refers back to Horeb. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. That's actually like a fornication verbiage in Hebrew, if you know this in the Hebrew language. In other words, you go in there and you bring in all these war thugs, the uh, Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, ISIS, to overthrow this nation. So Israel is doing, carrying out what Saul had started to do, but Jesus was able to stop him. And unfortunately, it brings Israel and a Christian-backed nation at the same time guilty before God Almighty in this area there. All right, so let's let's back up here. Uh we were we were actually and uh we were in Psalm 106. So we get back all the way up here to where that's at. So they forgot the God of their salvation, which had done great things in Egypt. Now, this is back then, but it's just showing you it's just moved forward. Wondrous works in the land of Ham and terrible things by the Red Sea. Therefore, he said that he would destroy them. Had not Moses, his chosen, stood before him in the breach to turn away his wrath, lest he should destroy them. All right. And now Jesus doing the same thing. See, even, even John and the other apostle were willing to burn them up with fire. But Jesus said, you don't know what spirit you're of. It wasn't the hour for that. Yea, they despised the pleasant land. They believed not his word, but murmured in their tents and hearkened not unto the voice of the Lord. Therefore, he lifted up his hand against them to overthrow them in the wilderness, to overthrow their seed also among the nations, to scatter them in the lands. And they joined themselves also into Bel Peor and sacrifices of the dead. That's pretty bad. Right now, let's go back to let's look also and and take another look here. Um, and Deuteronomy nine also in Horeb, he, you provoked the Lord to wrath, so the Lord was angry with you. You have uh, to, to have destroyed you when I was gone up into the mountain to receive the tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant which the Lord made with you. And then I abode there forty days, forty nights, and I neither did eat or drink uh, water. And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. And on them was written according to the, all the words which the Lord spake to you in Mount Horeb in the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And it came to pass the end of 40 days, 40 nights, that the Lord gave me the two tables of stone, even the tables of the covenant, which, by the way, if you look in Kings, I've jumped over that a couple of times. That's the only thing that was placed in the ark was the Ten Commandments. And the Lord said unto me, Rise, Get thee down quickly from hence, for thy people which thou hast brought forth out of Egypt have corrupted themselves, and they are quickly turned aside out of the way which I commanded them, and they made them a molten image. Furthermore, the Lord spake unto me, saying, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make thee a nation mightier and greater than they. So I turned and came down from the mount, and the mount burned with fire, and the two tables of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked, and behold, Ye had sinned against the Lord your God, and he made you a molten calf, and you turned aside quickly out of the way which the Lord had commanded you. And I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and break them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord at the first, forty days and forty nights. And I did neither eat nor drink water because of all your sins which you sinned in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Isn't it fascinating that Moses, he throws down those two stones and to me, it's just symbology as well, because the final judgment 
not only his lightnings, as the, the whole mountain was a lightning and everything else, according to what the scripture says when God was there on Mount Horeb, but also when those stones are thrown down, a type of the hail, the meteorites that will strike this earth in the not so distant future. I think that's very interesting to think about that. Uh, another one as well, I want to read to you quickly, and this is in Deuteronomy. We'll close soon here. <clears throat> we want to go to Deuteronomy 18. And I, I hope I've not missed uh, some of the important things that I wanted to make sure you were aware of. But let's see here. Deuteronomy 18, and I don't have listed what verse it is, so let me just see. Here we go, starting verse 15. <clears throat> Again, you have to remember, Malachi says, remember ye my servant Moses. And, you know, when he commanded the, the things that happened there. But let's look what else happened at Horeb at that time as well. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, liken unto me. Unto him you shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like it unto you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. Now, there's two things I want you to notice about this. Again, because we see that Jesus also comes in Malachi chapter 4 as well, the, the, uh, the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. But did you notice that God says that all oh, I will put my words in his mouth, verse 18, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Remember what Jesus said. This is what's so important. It was a sign to them. I don't know if I can get it right here. Yeah, here's one right here. All right. John chapter 12, verse 49. All right, we'll just look at this right here. He that rejoice, rejecteth me receiveth not my words and uh, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Again, the judgment that's coming. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me commandment which I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak thereof, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Jesus was showing you that he is that prophet in that right there. All that the Father has, says is going to be spoken, as God said there in Deuteronomy, okay? Deuteronomy 18, as we were reading it there, verse 18, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And there it was. So friends, what are, what are we talking about? Where are we at here? Um, we are about, and I've also got Revelation 16 here, so let me just drop down to Revelation 16 in closing. We are at a time of judgment. Very, very soon judgment. And your two witnesses, no doubt, will bring about that judgment. Here's the seventh bowl of the seventh angel in Revelation 16. Verse 17, and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice of a temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thundering, thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And, great. and the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came into the remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. 
and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent, and men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. The plague thereof was exceedingly great. Meteors, meteorites. The Dead Sea Scroll says meteorites that are actually going to fall. And, you know, and by the way, I don't know if I said this to you guys yet or not, but I'll just say this in closing as well. In the Qumran fragment, 4Q521, it speaks about the coming of Christ here. But in this one here, it also quotes Malachi chapter 4 and only quotes that Elijah at that time of the coming of Christ turns the, the fathers will return unto the sons, towards the sons. It only gives that part there for him. That's in fragment two. Uh, in fragment two, it says, just so you know where, what it's talking about, it says, and the Lord will perform marvelous acts such as not existed, just as he said, for he will heal the badly wounded and will make the dead live. He will proclaim good news to the poor. And there's a blank spot. He will lead thee, a blank spot, enrich the hungry, blank spot, okay? And the law of your father, and I will free them, another blank spot, line two, it is sure the fathers will return towards the sons. And then we get into a blank spot. Even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, they show only half of the prophecy of Malachi applying to John at the advent of the coming of Jesus Christ. So the turning of the hearts of the children to their fathers, it appears to be that Elijah when he comes to restore back. And that could be happening so simple and nobody even get it. Trying to wake up those that have ears to hear to know that indeed Jesus Christ is and was the Messiah of God. He was the fulfillment of all the scriptures of Mashiach, the Messiah. And there is one coming though that is not going to be of God. All right. He will not be the true one. As we were reading here just a second ago, I believe it's in Deuteronomy 18, um, when he raises up a prophet likened unto him, because when you get to verse 18, but the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, plural, even that prophet shall die. He's going to die. Why? That's the Antichrist that he's speaking about there. That's the one that they're about to bring forth. When Israel is saying the Messiah is at hand, that is that prophet that will speak in the name of God presumptuously. And he was not Jesus. He did not fulfill the scripture. So even here in Deuteronomy 18, we know there's an Antichrist spirit coming that will speak lies. And we know that that prophet is going to die. need to think about these things, friends. We are living in very perilous times. If you're Jewish and you don't know that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, I cannot encourage you enough to sincerely go before the Heavenly Father on your knees and ask him. Look at the scriptures. Search the scriptures. Jesus says, search the scriptures. He said, for you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. And they do. Every prophecy in there testifies that Jesus Christ truly was the Messiah. He was the Mashiach. He, there, there is no other order after the order of Aaron. It is the order of Melchizedek. And he was the Melchizedek. Look at your own Dead Sea Scrolls when they show you the, 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 the writings of Melchizedek and clearly every prophecy that dealt with the coming of the Messiah, even as the apostles have, have, have taught and shared with us in the Gospels, etc. And Paul and the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, all of them showing us. And what he said. That's the other thing you have to understand. What he says you're to hearken to. And all that did not hearken to the words of the prophet likened unto Moses that was rose up would be cut off. 
There was mercy, and there's been mercy for the last 2,000 years, but that mercy is almost over, friends. So I adjure you in the name of Jesus Christ to repent for the remission of your sins and to believe upon the only Son of God. You know, it's interesting in Psalm 81, and this is also in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they got a little bit different part in there. And I'll just say this in closing. Psalm 81, and I don't even think they translate this right in most cases there. The Dead Sea Scrolls really makes it amazing, and I don't have it in front of me to share with you. But it says here, um, or is it Psalm 82? Maybe it's Psalm 82. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among, among the gods. And actually, in the Hebrew language, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it says God standeth in the congregation of gods, plural. And he judgeth, and he judges them. That's what it's written in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And he judgeth them. Why does it say, even in, even in what we have here, judgeth among the gods, why does it do that? Remember when Jesus said, you and your law say, to whom the word of the Lord comes to, you are gods. He said, then how can you condemn me when I say I'm the son of God? They were descendants, half-breeds of the archons. They had mingled their seed, the Nephilim bloodline. As I said earlier, you have a Nephilim bloodline that purchased the land to create the state of Israel called the Rothschilds. And then we think this is something godly. So many of these scriptures that they have put in future tense were fulfilled 2,000 years ago. But there is one that's going to be fulfilled, yes. Yes. And it's about to be upon us. And they know it. And their false Christ, their antichrist is coming. And Jesus stood as God in the congregation. And he judged those Pharisees. And he called them what? Serpents. Vipers. That's exactly what he did. Oh, they call that anti-Semitic speech today, if you were to say it. Sure they would. Matthew, it's in Matthew chapter 12, it's in Matthew chapter 23. I mean, it's everywhere, right? Uh, we want, let's see. I don't know how I can get, oh, I'll just move it down like that. Matthew chapter 23, right? All the woes Jesus does to those Pharisees and scribes, calls them fools and blind, whether it's greater, the gold, the temple, etc., right? Hypocrites, you pay tithe and a mint, right? You get, I mean, he really blasts them. He said, Wherefore, verse 31, you be witnesses unto yourselves. You are, you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up the measure of your fathers. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? There you go. Reptilians, Nephilim. What, what do you want to call it? But you know, there were some Pharisees like Nicodemus that came out. Not all of them were bad. Not all of them were mingled. I'm Stephen Benu. If the message has blessed you in any way, please consider supporting this broadcast. We don't play games here. We'll tell you the truth. And um, if we make a mistake, we'll make that right. God bless you and thank you. Our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. By the way, too, 